Hello and welcome to the Lens at 177. And today we are continuing our series of uh, interviews with people who are associated with fighting the drug pandemic in the country. And today, the founder of Drug Free Wall Fiji, Kelsey Walatambu, joins me. Kelsey, uh, welcome to the program. First question to you. Do you find the Fijian community angry about what's yeah. happening in the country in regards to drugs? Yes, very much angry, wanting to know what's happening. You know, we're out there on the ground all across it, and, and that's what we're hearing directly, those questions coming from the people, the parents, the, the churches. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to say, you know what, instead of waiting for anybody else to do something, why don't you start yourself? Mm -hmm. You can start from within, you know, you as a person, then, you know, within your family, within your community, um, every little bit helps, yeah. So there is, a, um, you know, plenty of questions. Okay, uh, what, when is the rehabilitation going to be built? When are we going to see that? So we get all those different questions, but all we trying to do, where we come in is, we just trying to educate the best that we can. Mm -hmm. So why isn't, uh, well, why aren't the Fiji Fijians taking the next step to pressure the government yeah. to push them into uh, getting into action quickly? Good question. That's, I'm sure that's the question for the public, whoever is watching, whoever's listening right now. Ask yourself, if you want to, you know, if you want to know, take a, you know, step up, ask those questions. Whether you do it, you know, phone calls through the newspaper, TV, whatever you mean. The more we get the people to start asking those questions, yes, um, you know, things will happen. You know what, we've been doing this since 2019 with, with no help or support. What we've seen, what has been our greatest ally was the grassroots. They were coming forward saying, you know, they were the best support that we needed at that time. So we've done it before. Why not, you know, all across, whoever is, whoever it may be, step up, you know, if you need to question, you question, you challenge, where is it? What's happening? So what's the reality on the ground now, as you see it? Yeah. You know, I've been working in the prisons, like spending a few days in the prisons, going into St. Giles and um, going into one of the church out in the community and everything else. What I'm seeing is, is all across. It is, um, you know, it's not something that we can hide anymore. Um, you know, with it's math. But what I'm seeing a lot now is more of they're mixing. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, a few, you know, quite a bit of poly users. So they're not just using one drug, they're doing two or three all at the same time. Mm -hmm which is scary. Um, you know, there's a lot of unexplained deaths out there. Just to see it and you hear stories from lived experience from these, you know, our own people, you start to wonder, okay, we are in crisis. We, this is not something we can hide anymore. It's like, um, but you know, so sit there, instead of wait, keep on hearing all this, it's like, okay, what constructive solutions do we have? What can we do? So, you know, we're going to the prison, we're working directly with these, you know, offenders. Um, because, you know, the thing is, they're going to be released out in the community. How do we best prepare them when they come out into the community? They don't reoffend and go back in. We're talking about recidivism here. And then, obviously, when you're in St. Giles, talk to the guys and say, asking them directly, where is the gap? Where did we go wrong? What didn't we do right? Why didn't we implement so it stop you from coming into custody or stopping you from coming to St. Giles? Going to the church, you know, talking to the young people, youth, training them, building their capacity, how to help us prevent and combat illicit trafficking or drugs, uh, drug abuse. It's um, giving them the tools, sharing them. You know, this is what you can do within the church as youth. Amazing when you sit back and you watch these young people picking up, you know, the bat and they say, you know what, we're going to fight. We're going to start from our within churches, you know, and go across wherever they may be. But it's just amazing to see, you know, they're inspired, they're empowered. The uh, head of the Catholic Church, Archbishop uh, Peter Loi Chong, yeah. was on the program last week. He yeah. said uh, Fiji needed to do a social analysis of uh, the root causes of uh, yeah. the drug pandemic, which he had presented to government, but the government hasn't considered it. Mm. Do you think he's correct uh, in calling for the social analysis? Yes, yeah, so the social analysis is the research. We did the first sample in 2019 about the why. Yes, about the why. You know, during that time, I was fortunate to be part of the National Task Force that actually created the narcotics policy for the country. What we were researching and what we were gathering from um, our qualitative data, stories from people fed into the narcotics policy. So I hear what he's saying, and I'm, you know, I'm so grateful that he's brought it up again because that was five, six years ago. 
now, 2024, all these years later, I am sure there is going to be other reasons that comes up. Those are the why. Um, you know, what drugs more, what different drugs do we have on the ground now? Yeah. But to tell you the honest truth, in reality, there is quite a few foreign drugs in the country. And we have this tendency of being, you know, um, chemists. We like to create our own cocktails. Um, so it's, it's high time. I support what he's saying and I know we need to do it because with the little sample we had was just, you know, we didn't cover so much. We did uh, in the villages. That was literally the big push. Um, I would love to do a national one from, you know, urban areas to rural villages. But the maritime is the missing element mm. because when we talk about illicit trafficking and drugs uh, abuse, we need, we cannot forget those are tra those transitional, you know, from overseas through Fiji. The eyes and the legs for us are those in the maritime. Mm. We are not capturing those stories. Mm. When you when you talk about uh, chemists mixing drugs, uh, mm. where do they get the drugs? Uh, pharmacies. Uh, pharmacies. You know, we don't even have a, a registry. We, we don't monitor pharmacies. Anybody can just open their own pharmacy. Yes. So that is not controlled. Um, so obviously anyone can just, you know, have their own pharmacy or whatnot. But a lot of the, the drugs that come through, that's, you know, as you can see a few years back or, you know, we've had a few cases where all these are coming through the pharmacies and now. Now for crystal meth, the, the ingredient that balances those toxic chemical is pseudoephedrine. We don't control that in Australia. Yes, we do. If you buy pseudoephedrine, which is your cold or flu uh, medicine, you need a prescription to actually get that. Here, I can go and get five from one chemist and go to the next chemist and get another five or another five. Yes. Mm. Do you think then pharmacy, pharmaceutical laws in Fiji should be uh, strictly Every law in Fiji needs to be tightened up. We need to review all our laws from judiciary. Because um, you only got to do is sit back and look at the sentencing that's happened. Um, and you're trying to wonder and you question, how come they get a full length, you know, five, ten years custody for these offense, and then they get a leniency for this one? Where are we going wrong? Um, so it's not just the police, it's all across, even from uh, border security. Our borders are porous. So the, you know, even our legislation, our regulations from that needs to be changed. So it's not just, you know, what? We need to do an overhaul across the country. The 2023-2028 narcotics uh, uh, yeah. strategy talks about uh, legislation changes. Yeah. How soon do you think these changes should take place? Within the or next 12 months. Next 12 months. We need to do something within the next 12 months because the crisis is here right now. We've had, you know, our first, this year, 2024, we had our big um, seizure that happened to a 4.8 ton. That was in Nandi. Then we've had all these little cases all the way through. Um, but the thing is, it's um, this narcotics strategy, it needs to be in place. And I know, and I know for a fact, there is an action plan for the next 12 months. There is a few things in place. And, you know, I'm so glad that the, um, a few ministries, uh, public uh, PSs, they actually agreed and they signed off on the documents and now we have a green light to get this into action from demand reduction, uh, harm reduction and supply reduction. Those three pillars have different um, ministries that leads all of them. The good thing is, you know what, I, I push for the wider country. If you want a copy of that narcotics policy, please reach out because it's for all. We have a document now to say to government, like, this is what you signed up for. Where are we at with that? Yes, but not just for urban areas. We need to look at the rural areas and the maritime. You speak about uh, the three pillars uh, being controlled by three ministries, knowing how government bureaucracy works. Mm. Do you think it will get stuck in a pipeline somewhere soon? Well, you know what, if you really know the, the, the pillars, those pillars, they have lead uh, government ministry, but they have civil servants in those ministry. They have the church and they have the Vanua. It's okay as well, right? The thing is, it's like we need to empower our people to question. You know, one of the days where you sit back and say, you know, somebody else will do it, that's their problem. Uh-uh. This drug is in your home right now. Everybody is saying that. Yeah. Instead of sitting back anymore, we are burying our children here. I'm going into St. John and I'm seeing these children are coming and they're getting younger and younger. I'm in the prison, I'm seeing. Yes. You know, so it's high time. Instead of sitting back, okay, 
What can we do? What are we doing? You ask those questions. And civil society, you are in those pillars. You question. You question those ministries. Where are we at with this? How are we addressing this? In your view, uh, do you think uh, a, a political person should head this charge to clean Fiji of drugs? Remove politics from this. Will that work? Yeah, well, the thing is, like, drugs doesn't discriminate, uh, discriminate. It doesn't care what gender you are, what religious, you know, what religious group you are, um, what age group you are, what political affiliation you are. If we look at it now, I am sure from the current government to the opposition, everybody are facing the same thing in their own private families right now mm -hmm. yes so you say you know one person i don't want one person i want the whole ministry here i want the whole you know government itself because the thing is you know this is the people that voted for you they are waiting to see action right now so you can't just say just one person no all different ministry because there are literally on that narcotics policy every one of those ministries is identified they are accountable so they need to all step up if they don't step up in the next 12 months as you say Will you get more a angry at the government? <laughs> you know, uh, um, not just me though, not just me now. We've got people stepping up, they're standing up and saying, you know what, we want to save our children. We, think, we need things to be changed. You know, you look at HIV, eh? this time last year, we had three cases. We've got 10 now, so it's already tripled that number. So do we have to wait till what, the whole 12 months and then seeing the horrible numbers or do we want to do something now? We tend to wait till it blows up in our face before we do anything. So I keep telling people, if, instead of waiting for government to do something, okay, let's see what we're doing on the ground. Let's see what we're doing there and we're pushing, okay, this is what we're doing. And that's literally what I do. Through the outreach that we do, you know, I share it as much as I can to everyone, from ministers to civil servants to the grassroots, Facebook, that media, that's a huge platform, yes. Mm -hmm. Kelsey will take a short break and continue the discussion on the other side. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back, and uh, Kelsey from Drug Fiji, uh, Drug Free World Fiji is with me. Uh, Kelsey, uh, people don't know or, 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 or may be oblivious to this fact. Can you explain to me mm. what happens to a human body when they don't take in the meth when oh. it's time? Withdrawal, you go through withdrawal, right? Um, just after being a survivor myself, but then listening to those here, it's a withdrawal. It's when you're coming down on that high, you get aggressive, you get short-tempered. Some even become violent, you know, because you want that fix. You literally, you're irate. Everyone around you is walking around in eggshells because they don't want to get into trouble. Um, and that's really like the dangerous time because, you know, you want that fix. You don't care, you don't eat, you don't want to talk to anybody, you just want to, yeah, you just want the drug. Mm -hmm. uh, will it help the cause if uh, persons who are addicted or are coming out of addiction come out in the public and speak about their experiences? Yeah, um, those who are coming out of it, but then here in Fiji we have, we need to encourage those people, those survivors, and hey, we're talking about survivors, um, to actually, you know, take this and to share their narrative because it's quite powerful, um, you know, because they, you don't know, they might be able to help someone else or help their own family, their own children. Um, you know, after talking to so many people during oh, well, the last few years, that's what people gravitate to the most. They want to, you know, they don't want somebody that comes in, a professor or whatever it may be, because uh-uh, you're not even touch the core. It is so easy for us to, to be de defensive. We have so many masks on, but to penetrate that, you need to hear somebody's real life story. You need to hear what happened with them. Um, what was the, you know, the first drug? What was, why did they stay on? You know, why did they stay on it for so long? Whatever it may be, that's what gets to the people's heart. 
Because I know for the longest time, I've been working in Australia for over 20 years in the area of judicial system, from prisons to police, mental health. When you, when you get to the core, when you get to the heart, when that breaks, when that opens, then the healing process starts. You know, we were at um, Fiji Showcase. We had people coming out, you know, parents bringing their children, addict, coming straight up and saying, you know what, I'm an addict. And I said, okay, how are you going with that? What's your drug of choice? Amazing. They just started telling Because the thing is, they will, they gravitate to us a lot more because we're survivors. We relate, we know, we understand. We won't judge them because we've been there. So we know, they know it is safe to talk to these people because we trust these people. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. Do you think the Prime Minister or the Minister for Home Affairs should do the same? Go in to prisons, St. Giles, and see what's happening? Yeah, you know what? It, it, it's uh, quite an eye-opener for a lot of people. Eh? And I know I take this for granted of being able to walk into a room and you're sitting with, you know, addicts or offenders or whatever it may be. I take that for granted knowing that not a lot of people can do that. Eh? But I tell you what you would be, man, your life would change totally. It's a life-changing experience here. The thing is, they, they just want somebody to hear them. Not so much, you know, they don't want you to, you know, fix it straight away. No, just hear their stories. Yeah. Somebody just to hear what they've gone through. Yeah, um, and you'll learn so much more. And we learn, you know, different things. Fiji's changing all the time. Not, you know, you just say, maybe once a week, a month, nah, every day things are changing out there. Mm. In the schools uh, recently they had the drug free week and the logo that was all around in all schools, say no to drugs, <coughs> say no to drugs, say no to drugs. Is that logo enough? Mm. Or you know what, uh, when you, people say say no or you tell the kids don't do it, especially those side, they look at it and they say, oh, what do you think they're going to do? Yeah, the first thing they want to do is actually want to go and try it. Eh? We need to change our different tactics. We need to change our way of... Because the young people, they are, you know, what attracts them is quite different to what we think, we perceive, we adults think should happen. Eh? I would love for, you know, uh, Ministry of Education, even young people out there, churches, engage your youth, ask them, what would engage you? What would appeal to you here? What would get your attention? Because we need to empower our young people to actually be the peer-to-peer -peer support, or peer-to-peer, -to, -peer, to be the change agents, eh? Um, because they are in a different world to what we grew up in, the older generation. Mm -hmm. So what would appeal to the young people? Why don't we ask the young people that? Mm -hmm. The classmates, you know, the kids in the schools. What would, you know, what do you think we should have? How do we change this marketing? Let them be, have a say, be part of that campaign. Yeah. So if you had your way, you will stop using these logos, say no to drugs and say no to... Saying no and actually doing it are two different things. Mm. Yeah. So how about, you know, um, living, uh, changing my lifestyle, eh? living a drug-free life. Mm. Yes. I promise to, you know, make an oath all across. Different things. We need to look at, you know, ask the children, ask the kids, what would appeal to them? Or, you know, go to... Where this, where majority of these cohorts are, where there be change jobs, where be in the prison, get them be part of the process. Let them have a say. Let's talk about one of your favorite topics, uh, rehab, rehab centers, <laughs> missing in Fiji. Uh, what's the latest on that? I know the uh, strategy talks about uh, some form of uh, rehabilitation centers. Yeah. How soon should Fiji have these centers? Well, I know Ministry of Women and Children, they, um, they're working with Minis uh, Methodist Church. They've been given, I think, uh, three sites. They're renovating that, and they say that'll take from 12 to two years. That's for the young people. Um, for the adults, and I know Ministry of uh, Health, they are looking at different sites as well. So, you know, the thing is, you look across the country, what institution is already in place, a structure, sorry, what structure is in place but hasn't been used? One thing that came up was um, Fulton College in Cornwall. So that, you know what, that is a perfect site because it's got the structure in place, everything that you would need to help rehabilitate, you know, whoever it may be. And they have the, the land for farming as well. Um, so that's, 
that's where we're at right now. So I'm sure, you know, there's already shifts, there's already movements with different ministries to actually go out there and say, okay, um, how long will it take for the Ministry of Health? When they come? That one, I cannot answer that right now because I don't know what the timeline is. So how do you think the referrals will work? Or who, will, who, who can yeah. go there? Who can go there? So obviously from, and I'm sure there has to be a centre. Right now St. Giles is getting everybody. Whoever's in crisis or whatnot. I know from different uh, hospitals they have a crisis unit. But those severe, severe cases go through St. Giles. What we're trying to do, I think they're trying to identify that St. Giles will be the portal that will assess who is severe enough to go to different centers, yeah. Because mm -hmm. you, be, you should be able, or you, it is great to actually get everybody in one setting to assess each one before they get sent off to. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's up to the Ministry of Health how they're gonna actually, mm -hmm. yeah, roll that out. Given your experience in Australia, uh, who should manage these rehab centers or um, w what manpower should be there? Yeah, totally separate. They have to be independent from St. Giles and everything else. Uh, independent in the sense of even the location, um, the whole man pair of it. Okay, when you're working with addicts, right? Obviously, it has they have it has to be a controlled environment. It's not a holiday resort where they can just go in and walk out. No, and at the same time, it is protecting them in a healing space, but at the same time, stopping those contrabands, those drugs, because you know that still gets trafficked into rehab centers as well. So they need to make sure their security is maintained to be able to hold this. Guy. So it's just like a prison or a detention center. Yeah. Because, you know, to be able to heal these guys and not, they're going to be there for three months, a whole different um, team to actually run it. The rehab I was in, we had a dog unit even that did, the, you know, to help with the searches and everything else just to maintain that no contraband comes into rehab. Mm. That's without even looking at the case management that happens from withdrawal to detox to life skill. It's a whole three months program. Mm. Then you need to have, make sure that you've got a team that's ready when they release into the community, the post release. Eh? So what happens when they get out so they don't, you know, revert or relapse back to drugs? Mm. If, if a rehab center is open tomorrow, do you think Fiji has today, Fiji today has the skills and expertise to run that rehab center? We need to, we need to do some intensive assessment on that one. We need to upskill our team, whoever it may, we need to do a whole recruitment drive just on those. First, the basis, first and foremost, they need to have a certificate for, just the basis, certificate for in drugs and alcohol. Let's start with that. Counseling. Um, we've got to look at, you know, with, in the country, who's running different training on that, eh? Because um, when you're working with addicts, because it's a separate uh, clinical staff as well, eh? So um, we don't have the staff and we literally need to do a huge, if we're looking at building a rehab center, we need to start doing that recruitment drive now. Mm. Yeah. Kelsey will take a short break uh, for the time being. Mm -hmm. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back and today we are talking to Kelsey Vulatambu from Drug Free World Fiji. Uh, Kelsey, in the last segment, let's uh, talk about the economic impact of uh, uh, drugs on our country. Uh, have you done an assessment on uh, who, how much is costing the country in terms of... You know, I'm too scared to even look at that right now because all you've got to do is equate how much would it cost for one person to be St. Giles, yeah, compared to being outside, eh? Um, then the other one, how much would it cost to incarcerate somebody, whether it be in remand or even convicts, eh? How much, would, how much is that costing the taxpayers' money? And then you look at, um, you know, all the uh, offences that's happening across the country right now. You know, it's not just that person, that individual, it's the community safety is impacted about this. And so, you know, we've got to shift away just not from the economic, but what it's, you know, how is it instilling fear in people? You know, when I talk to people, they say, you know, um, where are you from? Like, which, which, which area are you from? 
people are starting to us, you know, associate uh, red zones to those different community, which is so sad because we've never gone to this, this you know, we've never gone to this stage. Um, you know, the thing is, is um, for them themselves, you ask the question, um, you know, can you go to the shop, you know, even if it's just around the corner at 7 o'clock or 7.30, no. So that is cost, you know, we are literally changing our lives because this is what's happening. They feel they're safe, the street is not safe. Um, you know, when you talk about money wise, it's like, what is it costing to take spares money? You get all these different addict substance abuses. And the thing is, it's not just about looking at addicts here in Fiji. When we did our research 2019, 60% of those people were drug users. Oh, and for a small sample eh, that we did. The thing is, we're not like everyday users, we're social users. We are weekend users, but when we use on the weekend, we binge. Man, we go, I'm talking to somebody, he went six days straight, start on the weekend, till the next weekend. That's, you know, for him, it's when you sit down and have a talent, what was happening with you? You know, how is that affecting, and I said, why did you do that? What was, you know, what was the push? He says, you know, I wanted to see how far I can push my limit. This is how dangerous these people are getting, yeah. So, you know, it's not just suffering the economic. And the last thing we need is to have the Mexico of the Pacific, known as the Fiji, because our biggest, you know, money, you know, hundreds, like we are tourists. How do we celebrate and encourage, you know, visitors to come to Fiji and say, we're safe, everything is safe here. So it's like, that's a really good question, not to ask me, but ask the whole public. Mm let them hear what they have to say mm. red zones you you mentioned red zones uh, will will it be helpful to the community to know which places in fiji are red zones uh, uh, and will that create a stigma on that community of course it does it, we already talk when we talk about saint giles mm. there's a whole stigma on saint giles when we talk about those that have been in custody in custody incarcerated there's a stigma on that now imagine you start flagging different community of course it's going to create this whole stigma and i'm sure enough you know what i have heard from people they've gone for a job interview and you know the panel i'm not judging them or employers or whatnot they were like so uh can you introduce yourself so the person introduced themselves their name where they're from that in itself they've lost a job mm. yeah so do you, do you know what i mean we don't want to create a sense of panic or whatnot um you know what what i tell what i'm trying to do is like Instead of looking at the stigma, all the negativity, let's look at some of the constructive things that we're doing. Can we celebrate? You know what? We, this is what the young people are doing in this area. This is what the church is doing in this area. This is what the parents are doing in this area. So mm -hmm. let's do that. On the issue of uh, uh, the impact of uh, economy on a family, if there is a member who's uh, hooked onto drugs. Yeah. How is the family affected? Well, you know what, I ask the, you know, the people that we've been working with and everything else, you know, instead of just talking about how drugs affects your body and mind, now how drugs is actually having an impact, a huge impact or affecting your family, your children, your wife, and sit back and watch what they have to say. Amazing. From divorce to breakdown of family to just, you know, as a husband, you, and you're the money owner, you're the bread owner, you know, they, they say themselves, you know what, when we get our money, we wonder, okay, is this enough to go and buy, you know, so-and-so, or, you know, family to have not eaten, what are they for dinner? No, it's those quick decisions that they make, they would go, they would choose the drug for them, and you ask them, do you think that's right decision making? No, it's not, yeah. But to have that r real, you know, conversation with them, you see their mind start to shift. And then, you know, how do you make the next, you know, the next choice or the next decision? How do you change? How do you not impact your family? They then started coming, you know, through that, they started owning some of the things that they've done, some of the wrongs. They'd say, uh, the drug within the church itself, uh, how is that impacting? They're this, this, this whole thing of, um, people are very fearful of them now. It's, um, you know, they're seeing, the crowd that they attract, uh, not the really good crowd. It's like the same kind that will just get them into trouble. Yeah, so it's, it's a great conversation maker. You sit there and you just start un, 
un yeah, unraveling what's actually happening within people's homes. You mentioned the maritime areas, maritime islands. How, 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 how bad is the situation in these islands currently? Yeah, so we did a um, awareness training with Lomé Viti province. All the Turangani Koro, Turangani Obusa, they came to Suva and we did that last year. We did a delivery of the drugs and everything else and say, okay, we're just going to ask you, you know, what are you seeing? Well, we weren't even ready of what they had to say. Eh? Because, you know, if we take it back to 2018, when those bricks of cocaine was washing up the shores of Fiji, and you ask, you know, um, you know, you ask the group, wherever we're at, what were you seeing? Things were coming up, and they were saying, um, they were seeing so many things. Even them themselves, you know, they see yachts that, that go past their shores, and it's like, are they registered? You know, are these guys, have they gone through, you know, they passed? Are they supposed to do that? Because keeping in mind, we have over 330 islands across the country, 600 million litres of water. How many boats do we have to patrol all that? We don't. For us, the best thing is to do is to give the tool, to have this frank conversation with those from the Merita, because if they become your eyes and ears, eh? They were sharing things of what they see on the other side. And for us, it's like, are we capturing what they say? Yes. We should be. If we're not, we should be. When you hold the hand of a drug addict at St. Giles or <coughs> prison, what, what do you tell them? The truth. The truth. Excuse me. <coughs> oh my God. Okay. <clears throat> I knew you were going to ask that. I was waiting for it. <clears throat> mm hmm. Ask me again. At St. Giles or yeah. in the prison, when, do, when you hold the hands, hands of an addict, what do you tell them? How do you console them? First of all, I tell them, you know what? I'm sitting across from you. This is the real me that you're seeing here. Yeah. Do you know how powerful it is when you share your story in St. Giles in front of these men and women, and you're in prison and you're doing that? They connect to you straight away. And I just say to them, you know what, I'm here with you and I'm being honest. I will meet you halfway. If you think, um, to, you know, if you're going to play with me and lie and be dishonest, don't waste my time. Yeah. You know, this is the real me and I'll expect you to be real with me as well. Yeah. Because the thing is, um, they've never met someone that is direct with them, that knows what they're going through that knows, you know, if there's any lies or whatnot, you see straight through that, you see the real them. Yeah, mm. and that's literally so. And I said to them, if you will allow me to do that, I will give you 120, 150% of my time. Yeah. So tell me, walk me through what you've gone through. I want to walk that with you. Mm. They started opening. And it's amazing when you open that little door, they started telling on. When they tell them, they don't even realizing what they're doing. You know, St. Giles, that young man that I met, he identified straight away where, what had went wrong with him. You know, he lost his mom, dad was a single dad, and he worked in security. He identified it straight away. Um, working with a man in, in prison, and you do the same thing, they start to, because the thing is what I'm seeing the most now, we don't create a safe space for men to talk openly about what they're going through. So it's locked in the vault. So when drugs or alcohol is involved, we see the explosion, not realizing there is something that they haven't opened up or they haven't acknowledged or they haven't shared or they haven't talked about. Because you know what? Men are perceived not to be weak because it's a sign of weakness if they show some kind of softness or you know um, tears maybe or whatever. Yeah, we, we don't allow our men to do that. I'm sorry. If we don't allow that to happen, we are locking, you know, we're doing the actual explosions when it happens. Those offenses, assaults, murders, those who are going to custody, whether in Sanja, we're doing that. Mm -hmm. So to save money for that, why don't we start small, have Talanoa session with the man. Mm -hmm. I'm enjoying what I'm doing, you know, in St. Giles. I'm enjoying what I'm doing in custody. I feel so at home when I'm behind the walls and always has been for over 20 years of my life because that has been my world and I've lived, I've walked that. If I can get out of the messes that I went through, why can't they? And I know all I needed was somebody that I can trust that will not judge me, will not say, you know what, um, challenge or whatnot. No, sit there, 
you know, it takes courage to listen to somebody's story, to be able to see that. I said, I care. You know, I know. I went through that as well. But this is what I did. Yes. Those who t take drugs or are drug addicts, do you do you think they fear death? That one day they will die. They can die. No, you know what? Uh, me in my time, it depends what drug I was on. Like uh, marijuana did absolutely nothing for me. Meth was my drug of choice. Eh? I didn't. Um, I wouldn't. No, there's like um, when you're on it, you think you're Superman or Superwoman for that matter. Yeah, you didn't care. Um, but that's what the drug was doing, literally. But it's when you're coming down on the withdrawal, when you're actually coming down, the reality hits you. Because most of the time you take the drugs to numb the pain, to block out the noises. You don't want to be, man, I want to be tripping on something else instead of that. Um, so that's, if they don't get a hit or whatnot, that's when um, you become suicidal when you're actually coming down on that withdrawal. Eh? That's why it's so crucial when someone's coming down, especially if they're thinking, this is it, I want to change. Their recovery mm -hmm. took me seven times mm -hmm. to actually walk away successfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Fiji, have you dealt with somebody or handled somebody who was on his or her deathbed related to drugs? Suicide, on the phone, yeah. Someone that literally was in a critical mess. He, was, he rang me at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, 2.30. Never forget. That was in 2020. Uh, no, 2019. And he just said, Miss, I just want to, I just want to, you know, tell you. I met him previously. And then I said to him, you know, this is my number. Because when we go and deliver, I give my number. And I say, you know, back in those times, we never had a helpline or a suicide line. So I would give my number and I said, you know, call me if you have to the audience, you call me if you need somebody to talk to. Give my number. So 2.30 in the morning, my phone rings. And I answered and I said, hello. And he said, no. pause. And I said, look, if you're there and you want to talk, I'm here. Miss, I just want to tell you, you know, really in a bad place right now. OK, what's happening? So he started to tell me his whole journey. The, the officer in me, especially you know, in an area of the judicial system, I need to de-escalate what he was going through. You know, found out why he was sitting on the bridge, um, what he has taken, yeah, but stay on the line. I stayed on the line with him for an hour at least, and I said to him, um, you know, walk him from there. I need to make sure that he was walking away from the bridge to some, from the bridge to something, someplace safe. Yeah? Um, and I said to him, like, I'm going to be on the phone. You call me at 9 o'clock, and I need you to call me at 9 o'clock. So and he said, yes, Miss I will. I never slept that night because I was worried and thinking, Lord, you know, what has happened to him? But a whole lot of prayer happened in between the time we hung up to when we picked up the phone. 8.30 in the morning, he called, and he said, Miss, I'm fine now. What happened? And he said, I just went, you know. And I said, OK, don't wait till it's too late. You pick up the phone, you talk to me. I've been there. Yeah, I know exactly where you're at, but if I can, you know, offer you a helping hand, even through my phone, that's it, that's what I'm supposed to do. That was one life, that's one life. So, you know, as every now and again, he would call and just, you know, uh, message Talanoa, and that's the thing. As long as there's a lifeline at the end of it, for them to reach out and talk. Kelsey, thank you very much for speaking to me, and all the best in the work you do. Thank you very much.